Welcome back. This week in digital photography, we're taking a look at some different types of photography and sharing some of the secrets with regard to the gear and the techniques used in these specific areas to create strong images. This video will take a look at landscape photography and will focus on the many different factors that impact your final image. We'll talk about composition, gear, as well as the natural world, including things like weather, timing, and lighting. Landscape is a lot like real estate. It's all about location, location, location. This is one area of photography that you'll need to spend a fair amount of time outdoors in the elements at great locations. It could be lakes, rivers, forests, even urban landscapes, but you'll need to really get to know an area when you're shooting it for landscape. Returning to the same location time and time again can lead to dramatically different results. Many landscape photographers return to the same location throughout the year over many years to see how the landscape looks in warm weather and cold weather with snow or sun. They will visit at sunrise, mid-morning, mid-afternoon, evening blue light, and even at night for night sky images. Returning to the same spot many times can give you as a photographer a unique perspective. You'll know where the sun is going to set in May and when it will rise in October. You'll know when the fall colors are going to be at their best. You'll know where to stand to put the barn perfectly in line with the rising sun or the house in the distance. As a landscape photographer, the sun is your main light source. And while you can't simply move the sun into the right position, you can get to know where the light will be at certain times of day and how that light will impact your images. This image I shot in June of 2021 over Bear Lake in the Adirondacks. It looked very different the following morning when the sun was behind me rather than in front of me. Pay attention to the direction of light as it hits your scene and be ready to make decisions about how to use that light to make the best images. Landscape photographers often find themselves studying to be junior meteorologists. They can read the clouds to know if it'll be clear in the time to unveil a beautiful sunset or if they'll thicken up to create soft, beautiful light for detailed shots. They'll know if a heavy snowstorm is expected and be able to get themselves into the right location to record beautiful snowy scenes, icy lakes, or snow-capped mountains. They'll pay attention to the temperatures and the winds to know just when to shoot the fall colors before a heavy wind pulls everything off the trees. Shooting landscapes can give you an opportunity for a wide range of exposures. Long exposures can work great to create fairy tale like motion in rivers or painterly effects looking out over a meadow of tall grasses. Use your depth of field to create blur or sharp focus depending on the look that you're going for. Using a tripod can allow you to shoot long exposures that can even out the edges of water or give you a great depth of field to record great big panoramas. Tripods also slow down the process and give you time to carefully compose your images, paying attention to colors, shapes, and so on. While landscape photographers are often using wide angle lens and trying to capture scenes of mass grandeur, sometimes switching up to a long lens can allow you to pull out abstract details from the bigger picture. Landscape photographers generally don't need a ton of specialized equipment. But one thing you'll find in every landscape photographer's bag is the polarizing filter. This filter is a piece of polarized glass mounted in a metal ring that screws into the front of your lens. Polarizers are used to cut down on the light coming into the camera from different angles, and the result is a greater saturation of color and a reduction in glare and reflection. Using a polarizer when photographing water allows you to be able to see through the water into the underwater world. Polarizers can also be used to cut the glare of window glass. Landscape photographers often rely on polarizers to increase saturation and contrast in blue skies with puffy white clouds. Polarizers are one of the few filters that can't readily be replicated in Photoshop, so it's one of the few filters that I still carry in my bag, even in the digital era. To be most effective, polarizers must be used at a 90 degree angle to the sun. When you're using a polarizer, you can actually rotate the filter on the front of the lens with just how much impact it'll have on the scene. It's a bit of trial and error, but it can really enhance your images. 
When shooting for landscapes, you want to remember your storytelling aspect of photography. Like any good fairy tale, your image will benefit from having a beginning, a middle, and an end. In photography, we see this with a foreground, a middle ground, and a background. Having interesting elements at each level allows you to create three-dimensional, compelling images. Many landscape photographers love to use water to create striking reflections. It could be a lake reflecting the distant mountain, or even a simple puddle in a parking lot reflecting the city skyline at night. All too often, we get used to seeing a landscape in a particular way, from a particular angle, from a particular height. Sometimes simply getting low and shooting upwards towards a subject, or even standing tall and looking downwards from a great height, can really change the perspective into something magical. While color may be the most common way to portray landscape, shooting for black and white or even infrared can be a dramatic shift from the traditional feel of a landscape image. Panoramic images can have great impact, if for no other reason than the fact that we don't really see a lot of panoramics. It's a little different and the difference can make a real impact in your images. There are really two different ways to create a panoramic. The simple way is to simply take a traditional image and then crop it down in Photoshop off the top and bottom to give that impression of a panoramic image. A better way, however, is to shoot it on a tripod and create multiple exposures, being sure to keep the camera level and the exposure consistent as you pan across the scene. Then, after you've downloaded your images, stitch all of the frames together in Photoshop to create one wider panorama. This method gives you a much higher resolution for your images, so you can print them out for big prints. Another technique that involves shooting multiple images is a technique known as high dynamic range or HDR photography. Our human eye can see as a much greater range of tones, brights and darks than what our camera can record. By keeping your camera on a tripod and shooting the same scenes with more and less exposure, allow you to capture one version that retains details in the shadows and another version that keeps detail in the highlights. When I shot this image, I captured five images one with a light meter set to zero, meaning proper exposure, and then two more frames at one and two stops underexposed, and finally two more frames at one and two stops overexposed. In Photoshop, I blended all five images together to create the final image you see here. You can see fine details in the darkest of pines and even in the brightest areas of the sunset. That's a wrap for this video on landscape photography. Coming up next, take a look at macro photography. We'll take a deep dive into the micro miniature world full of textures, details, and unique perspectives. Go ahead back to the Moodle now and open up the video on macro photography.